Well, yeah, thank you. Um, I'm Luke. Uh, so yes, I'm a filmmaker here in Santa Fe. Um, about five years ago, uh, Chris and I, my producer over here, came together through some uh, crazy series of events. We were asked to shoot a one-day video presentation, and in the course of that, I mentioned the idea of maybe doing a larger documentary project about the, the subject, which is this this end group that has a center here in Santa Fe. And uh, you know, if you told me at that time that five years later I would be giving a talk about silence, I might not even believe that, because at the time, I don't think I was qualified at all to talk about something like that. Uh, maybe I'm not still, but um, over the course of this, I cross paths and cross paths with some really interesting Zen masters, teachers, poets, um, and all kind of on the subject of meditation. Um, so I think maybe I would hope I learned a few things in the course of that that uh, might have value to, the, to you guys. I'm going to show a few minutes of the film. We've got a two, minute tra two and a half minute trailer and then just a couple of scenes that I picked that I felt had some relevance to uh, the talk today. Um, unfortunately, the projector, it's like a Wi-Fi connection, so it's choppy, so um, at least it's only five minutes. I think it's bearable, but yes, I apologize for the video quality, but I will just play this. We're a very young species. We've only been around 100 or 150,000 years. Compared with the next youngest ape, we've had only a few thousand generations versus a million generations. We're still basically learning how to be human. And it doesn't matter what technology we have. We still need to learn how to be human. Now, in a superficially globalized world, how great to discover that there's an even deeper sense in which we're totally connected already. Zen comes out of Buddhism, but Zen is a pure experience only about yourself. It is a meditation practice, so you can come from all religions and from all countries and just uh, sit there to experience yourself and to discover who you are and what this purpose of uh, life is. People think, I am here, you are there. The separation of and existence, you, that is illusion. Zen was born in a time of crisis. In the Tang Dynasty in China, these two great traditions of Buddhism and Taoism kind of fused and became Zen. During that period, there was a catastrophic civil war. Now, we are in a time of crisis, it seems where the reality of no separation is being obscured and division is deliberately being created. Well, as Zen practitioners, we can't ourselves turn to hatred, but we can stand for love and non-separation. And we do, and we must, and we believe that this practice is in itself actually taking a stand against forces of divisiveness. We're in a situation where capitalism is under threat, and rightly so, in its present form. And what happens in those sort of times in history is people turn in on each other. It creates a space for a lot of, of fear, dog-eat-dog uh, uh, -dog mentality. And this is the absolute opportune time for the Buddha Dharma uh, to be present in the world. If you're not dealing with life as one, you're not doing Zen from marriage standpoint. Well, when we look at it superficially, the origin point of our practice is the Buddha's original experience, the experience of his true nature. And you know, this is something that happened 2,500 years ago. But uh, as a matter of fact, this experience is uh, available to each of us at any moment. So this is the origin point that uh, we carry with us. 
It dwells within us, in fact. And, uh, you know, normally we speak of Buddhism and what comes to mind is a religion, a set of uh, practices and rituals and perhaps even some sutras and dogma. But uh, when it comes down to actual practice, the experience of the Buddha's uh, own awakening is available to us all. And uh, this is what uh, uh, Sanbo Zen is dedicated to. Every people think, I am here, you are there. The separation of the existence, you, that is illusion. That is the way we are starting. Shakyamuni Buddha found, you know, this is illusion. When he had the uh, enlightenment expense, first thing he said, there are few words left from top of the heaven down to the earth, me alone exists, meaning just this one existence. There's no separation. That, that is the uh, uh, discovery. Therefore, when we are trying to approach or uh, get the same experience, what we have to do is the, to get out of the separation. Today, there's a growing tide of political extremism that is seeking to make very tangible separations. You know, whether it's walls or leaving unions of nations or closing the borders to immigrants and so on. These are all very tangible expressions of separation, but they're all, from our point of view, misguided. And to be building walls between communities, for example, separating between Israelis and Palestinians and the Israeli efforts to just construct, having constructed a physical wall between the two communities. And of course, the last thing we want to see. So what do we do? Well, the Zen response is actually to go to Israel and have silent retreats that bring together Israelis and Palestinians. And our Abbott has indeed been doing that. Not necessarily you know, the path of words, which might seem very counterintuitive to a lot of people, but we believe that actually sitting together in silence can be just as powerful in a different way and can heal wounds and heal separation. Maybe more profoundly in the long run, who knows? very young species. We've only been around a hundred. So, yeah, that was two, two scenes from the film, plus the trailer. Um, so, uh, I wish I could just give you guys a link to watch the whole film right now. It's not currently online, but it will be very soon, and uh, we hope to do a screening in Santa Fe, too, uh, within the next few months. So. Keep an eye out, and uh, if you want to see it, or get in touch with me, we'll make sure that you get get the info um, if you're uh, if you're interested. Um, so yeah, uh, silence. Um, I guess it's kind of an awkward. I mean, an awkward thing to talk about for sure, but uh, <laughs> an awkward thing in uh, silence. This week. Yeah. That was there you go. Um, you know, there's this kind of inherent awkwardness when you're forced into a silent moment with someone, don't know what to say. Um, partner that you're with doesn't say anything, or a teacher or speaker. Um, I, would, I went online to watch, see if other people had done talks about silence, um, see if I could steal some stuff from them. <laughs> and there was a TED talk uh, that was like 17 minutes. I was like, oh cool, if this guy talked about it for 17 minutes, it shouldn't be too problem. Then he starts off with this long, awkward silence at the beginning just to prove this point that if someone came up to this podium and didn't say anything for a while, that would be really awkward. And then at the end, they do a four and a half minute period of silence, which they record. So really, it was like a 10 minute talk. <laughs> so I'm not going to do that unless I completely run out of stuff to say. Um, but yeah, it's, you know, just there's this inherent awkwardness when you expect something. You expect sound or speaking, and there isn't any. And uh, which is kind of weird, because you would think that silence is like a very natural thing. It predates machinery and language and music and ringtones and uh, all of that. But I guess um, while I was reading about this, I learned that in a lot of animals, social animals, humans included, silence can actually be a sign of danger, because animals that make contact calls and stuff 
will freeze and go silent um, when there's a, a sense of danger, so that that creates kind of this uneasiness that might explain why today we constantly just try and surround ourselves with, with sound at all times and just constant auditory stimulus is that maybe there is this uncomfortable feeling that invokes in us, which goes back to our evolutionary past. Um, but, um, let's see, here's a quote about, uh, <clears throat> silence no longer exists as a world, but only in fragments, as the remains of the world. As man is always frightened by remains, so he is frightened by the remains of silence. Um, that's a Swiss philosopher. But uh, on the flip side of it, there's been some interesting, like, uh, so basically we always used to think of the ear as basically like a microphone plugged into something. Sound comes in and goes to the brain. And what they've actually found out now is there's actually more connections from the brain to the ear than there are from the ear to the brain. So there's actually this really complicated interaction between the ear and the brain can kind of control what you hear, gain it, you know, if it's quiet or something. And uh, that allows for some really interesting um, studies and stuff they've done in like sonic isolation chambers. So this isn't very much like not a natural thing. This is kind of <clears throat> through modern technology, we can isolate sound so much that you get to like two orders of Right, ten, negative 10 decibels, so like two orders of magnitude less than what the human could even hear. And when you put people in that environment, you start to have really weird auditory hallucinations, and uh, your brain just starts doing kind of weird things. I think that just kind of shows how complicated this interaction is between our brain and what we feel and our emotions and what we hear. Um, much more complicated than just sound going into a microphone. And uh, so that's an extreme example, of course, going into a sonic isolation chamber. But I think it just kind of helps illustrate in an extreme example how powerful this relationship is between our, our sonic environments and, uh, and what we think, what we feel. Um, so obviously the, the last clip we watched in the film about Israel is kind of looking at this really specific example, this idea of can people that have drastically different perspectives and interests in this world, can you create some sort of common ground just by meditating in silence and uh, just, I think, sitting in the presence of another person without saying a thing, it really does these kind of, these divisions and this perceived separateness from them um, can, uh, can just kind of fade away and uh, over the course of this film, I think we, we just saw this again and again with so many different people and very different examples, but um, I think it is to say, safe to say that there is this kind of commonality that transcends all of our different languages and cultures and political opinions. Um, so throughout the film, that was something that we really tried to, um, tried to focus on. Uh, another scene that I didn't include here, we had Jeremy Irons talk about just kind of isolating yourself from all of this noise and all the sounds of, of modern life, which, I mean, I guess it's kind of low-hanging fruit. It's not like this is a, a radical new idea, but um, I think a lot of people say it without ever actually doing it. It's like, you know, it sounds nice to say, oh, I got to get out in nature more, you know, get out of the city or whatever how much would you actually take that step? Some people, of course, do all the time, but, um, you know, a lot of people don't. So I think that's a really important point, and I figure if you're going to make a kind of obvious point, you might as well have Jeremy Irons make it for you. Um, but uh, with that in mind, I just kind of compiled. We, have, we did talk some about the science of meditation in the film and just how it really can change your brain and that like the wiring of your brain is definitely not fixed. And meditation is one way that you can really um, get positive benefits from that. But in terms of just silence specifically, I kind of compiled a few scientific Various studies have uh, produced some interesting results of what, what some of the positive effects of just silence in different forms are. Uh, it can regenerate brain cells, particularly in the hippocampus, which is one of the major centers for memory and learning. Um, 
something called attention restoration theory says that the brain can restore its, its finite cognitive resources um, when we experience lower levels of auditory input. Um, and there's been a couple studies to back that up. Um, a 2006 study found that two minutes of silence is actually more than relaxing than listening to calming music, which was actually supposed to be their control, and then they found out in the end to, of which types of music would be more calming, and it turns out that actually just being in silence had a more calming effect than uh, any of them. And then finally, kind of the big one is just noise pollution in general does lead to higher blood pressure. It, uh, your body releases more cortisol, which um, can also suppress the immune system and uh, suppress bone growth. So there are some very serious kind of negative health effects from this constant bombardment of noise that we have. And uh, the World Health Organization even tried to put a number on it. The 340 million residents of Western Europe, roughly the same population of the United States, Annually lost, an, annually lost a million years of healthy life because of noise. So, it's, you know, beyond just the psychological effects that this has on us, there also is definitely um, health effects. And of course, this is very recent, so we can't expect to have adapted to that because it's really just since the Industrial Revolution, I would say, that, that noise has become such a pervasive thing in our uh, society. So. Um, so we're still kind of learning how to adapt to that. And uh, yeah, the higher blood pressure, cortisol is one of, I think, the most pronounced effects that there are negative ramifications of that. But uh, I think there's a lot more. And uh, things like Zen meditation, I think, at least provide one kind of window into how we might be able to change our approach and not be so much subject to these forces beyond our control. like like the ambient noise all around us. Um, the first uh, commercial radio broadcast was almost exactly 100 years, it was early 20, uh, 1920. So we're pretty much going on like exactly 100 years now of having just, when, when, we, when we have silence now, the response is to go turn on a radio or turn on a music or something. And so, yeah, 100 years is not an insignificant amount of time. We can start to really see how that's affecting us, but obviously we're not, we haven't figured it out. We're not, we're not uh, responding in ways. There are some examples, you know, more noise res restrictions, um, aircraft, vehicles are getting quieter. So it, it's not like we're, um, we're out of luck here, but it's, I think it's gonna be a long time before we really fix that, and as long as there's more people and more people are moving to cities, overall, this bombardment of noise is, I don't think, gonna go away anytime soon. Um, so, um, yeah, with all that in mind, I think it's just good to kind of ponder what the effects are, even just what is silence. Is it the absence of sound? Is it the absence of sound you can't control? But ambient noise is okay, um, or is it more of a state of mind? Like in, in Hindu philosophy, like Sanskrit has like 50 words just for silence. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, the main usage is like silence of the mind. So much more a state of mind than a acoustic environment. Um, so um, here's Eckert. Eckhart Tolle had a quote uh, that silence can be seen as either the absence of noise or as the space in which sound exists, just as inner silence can be seen as the absence of thought or the space in which thoughts are perceived. So, I mean, I think just philosophically even the question, what is silence exactly? What are we talking about when we talk about silence? And um, I kind of tried to encompass a few of the different interpretations. Obviously in Zen there's, um, their, their interpretation, um, but I'd like every religion, every philosophy has at least some sort of perspective on the importance of silence, and they all hold it to have some, some significance, of course. So I think it's worth the time to, uh, to ponder, even if I wouldn't have maybe unless circumstances had pushed me in that direction. Um, and uh, <coughs> So uh, a month ago we showed our film in Tel Aviv and uh, a friend of mine showed her film 
before ours, which was a seven minute film specifically about silence. And uh, I tried to get a copy of it, but I wasn't able to in time. And it probably would have been a cop out anyway to just show a seven minute film. It's not even mine here. But um, it was a neat film about just the, the interaction with another person. It was her and her boyfriend shot it together, and they didn't use any dialogue, but kind of depicted all the interactions that you can have with someone that you're close to like that without speaking. Um, but then at the end, she kind of included this really nice little story that I thought I would just read um, instead. So um, this is a <clears throat> story from India. Two great mystics of India, Kabir and Fari, met and for two days sat silently together. The disciples were very much frustrated. They wanted them to talk. They wanted them to talk so that they could hear something valuable. They were hoping, for months they were hoping, that Kabir and Farid would meet, and that there would be a great showering, and they would enjoy it. But they were just sitting silently, and the disciples were dozing, yawning, wondering what happened to these two people, because they were never silent before. <laughs> Kabir was never silent with his disciples, and neither was Farid. They were continuously hammering on them. But the disciples could not say anything. It was not appropriate. After two days, when Kabir and Farid hugged each other and said goodbye, that too in silence, and when the disciples were left with their masters, the followers of Kabir said, what went wrong? For months we've been waiting for Farid to come, and he came, and you never spoke a single word, and we were waiting and waiting. These two days have been hell. And Kabir <laughs> laughed. He said, but there was nothing to say. He can understand silence. If I had said anything, he would have thought me ignorant. Because when silence is there, and silence can say it, what is the use of words? And the followers of Farid asked him, what happened? Why didn't you speak? And Farid said, are you mad? Speaking with Kabir? We were in exactly the same space. So there was nothing to convey, nothing to say. The moment I looked into his eyes and he looked into mine, we recognized. The dialogue finished at the first moment. Then for two days, what were you doing for two days? And Farid said, we were just enjoying each other's space. We were guests to each other. We overlapped each other. We overflowed each other. We mingled with each other. We danced, we sang but it all happened in silence. When silence can speak, what is the native language? <laughs> so, yeah, um, I, I, Chris can totally come up here too. He's much more experienced with like the formals and side of things. If you guys have any questions on that, in terms of the film production side of things or anything that I talked about today, um, if anyone has any questions. Do you want to say anything, Chris? <laughs> you can do the awkward silence thing if you want. Uh, you know, you mentioned something that uh, Eckhart Tolle said. Uh, and to a lot of people, Eckhart Tolle is more accessible, maybe even Zen. And I want to be clear that this is really a perennial. Uh, attempt at a film, a documentary. In other words, it's not really about Zen. It's through the vehicle of a Sambo Zen lineage and the story of the Westerners back in times of uh, the Vietnam War who just dropped out. And they went to uh, Tibet and China and Japan and uh, India. And my curiosity was, what happened to these people? What do their lives look like today? More importantly, what do their actions look like today? Mm -hmm. Okay? And um, Eckert says, um, as, as Luke was sharing, that you could call silence, I think this is a better definition, as the space in which all thought, all perception, and all sensation arises and disappears. And what is left there? What was there before this thought right now? What was there in between this thought and the next thought that didn't change? Because you need to have one thought in order to precipitate the next thought, because it's all conception. So this movie speaks to a common ground. And you heard the Roshi, uh, Yamada <coughs> Ryan Roshi. Um, share with us that the illusion is that we're separate to begin with. And that's a very hard thing to, to spot. 
some of us intuitively have an understanding that everything is one. But we don't really understand, and it doesn't really walk with us into combative political discussion, uh, ideological and sociological issues. Um, but if you really take the time to just allow yourself to listen and watch what's happening in the context of your sensing, your sense of touch, your swirling, your hearing, thoughts, your emotions, um, all of this stuff, all your perceptions, your visual field. Okay, it's all appearing where and to whom. And this is what Ryan Roshi, I think, is trying to help us to be able to see because it's not a belief. It's something which is a human experience. It's a common human experience. Uh, when we're flooded with um, information, <laughs> um, be it television, be it talking, be it whatever, um, we have a tendency to begin to develop patterns of action and reaction. And in actuality, what I am or who I am is an aggregation of consistent patterns, some conscious and some sub subconscious, that keep repeating themselves. And as you take the time and break, not to do anything very difficult, there are some tricks and techniques to helping you be able to sit quietly for a period of time. <laughs> <laughs> It's just the back part of my mind. So um, as we take the time to sit, and there are some tricks and tips to be able to help you to be able to sit um, in a still method, and just be able to breathe and slow down, breathe and allow, there is a progression that goes through where you begin to see all your repetitive behaviors, and you start wondering what's going on here. We were born, we accumulated reactive uh, uh, programming, and as you sit more and more, it blossoms and you begin to see the space in between the behaviors and that which hosts it. Let's put it that way. Okay? And it's the discovery of what you're hosting which is revolutionary if it is a personal and direct experience. Absolutely change the whole focus of your life from uh, sort of a material orientation in which we are trying to find happiness, which is another common human trait, through the acquisition and the experience of things, be they sounds, perceptions, or thoughts, and letting go of that and realizing that there is something much bigger, much grander, and much more universal, a boundless sense of freedom in which all of this stuff entertains itself. So the process of doing nothing more than observing this whole process and what's going on through this mechanism and what's going on everywhere else is very liberating. It brings incredible peace in uh, times of conflict, and that's what the subhead of our movie is, finding peace in troubled times. Mm -hmm. I don't think that we can say uh, we ha could have a better forum or dharma than what we're going through right at this moment in this country and in this world. Um, and this testing of our ability to be able to reconnect with our central being, humanness, and let go of all this horrible fighting and conflict that we're going through and realize that we share a common, infinite, boundless freedom, which is entertaining all of us. And it is a remarkable uh, opportunity, and I, uh, I hope, if nothing else, that this film will allow us to entertain this new way of communicating, like you were saying about Kabir and Hafiz, um, and to realize and find some peace in, in troubled times. Thank you. So I think we went a few minutes over, but if anyone has any questions, feel free if you have to leave to sneak on out, but yeah. Luke, are you seeing a trend uh, worldwide in attention to this topic? 
Yeah, I mean, it's weird. I think there's definitely a growing interest. There's also a place, um, like in Israel, they had done these big sits, sittings with the Palestinians and the Israelis together. Um, the guy who runs that place came to our screening, and he's like, nobody's coming now. And he's like, hopefully this film, he's like, it's good so many people came, because hopefully now we get some more people coming to sit. So, I mean, I don't know if it's like exploding necessarily, but then you see stuff like mindfulness and other meditation practices. There's so many apps now that can do guided meditation. So, so yeah, I think there is definitely a growing interest. It's just not, Zen is kind of one avenue of that, but overall, I think, absolutely, yeah. Okay, I have uh, two questions. First, when you mentioned the health effects of noise pollution, would you say the same for light pollution, which is happening ever more presently? And then the second question was, when you look at people meditating, they're, you know, they're just, lots of times they're sitting, and, and they're totally still. And I recently um, was involved in um, a group doing, re um, or involved in, uh, or expressing re relaxation uh, techniques. And there was some very, very quiet music going. And yes, there was a little bit of direction, but not a whole lot. And I was wondering again, whether you see this, you know, as, uh, again, when people are meditating as motionless, or do you see it as also, you know, people moving in ways that are relaxing parts of their body? And it also reminds me to quote, uh, with the two people, the um, two you know, was in the monks, but who said something like, "And we danced, and we did, we did, we did everything, but we did it in silence." So yeah. I'm assuming they didn't stay, you know, still for two days straight. <laughs> I don't that think so. Very healthy. Um, yeah. I mean, as far as like, I mean, I think any form of pollution is bad. I think that's basically what the word means. Um, Sound pollution is weird because like sound waves are so hard to isolate. Mm -hmm. Like you can put blackout curtains on your windows, you can get air purifiers, and you know, so there's a lot you can do to isolate yourself from a lot of the forms of communicate of pollution in the world. But um, noise pollution is really really hard to to cut out. So I think um, yeah. Um, I think it's kind of unique in that sense that we're just so, no matter what you do, you're always going to be at the whim of a jet airplane flying over or a train or cars going by. So it just maybe is one where we have even less control than we do um, with other forms of pollution. So in terms of the meditation, like um, definitely in the Zen practice, you do your, your stationary meditations, but they also do walking meditations and the, uh, the way Henry says it, the, um, the, the guy, the British guy, Henry in the film, he runs Mountain Cloud Zen Center here. So if you liked what he said, I mean, he's just an amazing guy and super engaging and I can relate to him. So if you want more of that, definitely check out Mountain Cloud. Um, but um, the way he says it is that these walking meditations, you're trying to find the same stillness and motion that you find when you're sitting motionless. And, I think the same kind of goes with sound. If, if you can meditate in a silent environment, but learn to con really control your breathing and your thoughts and your state of mind, then if you had to meditate in a subway station or you know somewhere where you can't isolate yourself from the noise, I think I personally have not reached that level and I'm definitely subject to, to disturbances if I'm trying to meditate. But I think that's kind of the goal, is reach that point where you can have silence of the mind no matter what kind of noise and commotion is happening around you. So. Do, do earplugs help? Because I, was, I, don't know what you're I was thinking about. about that recently. I was like, hey, that just, I don't know, it just kind of feels like cheating, I think. <laughs> <laughs> there, there is an assumption. Uh, um, There's I, this assumption that sound, and this is going to respond very quickly yeah. to you, that sound yeah. is something terrible. When you sit in silence, you realize that everything comes from silence. Everything that you're experiencing comes from silence. Meditation as a practice is about learning, first by sitting still, because we have so many distractions, but then we take breaks every 30 minutes and we walk and we try to maintain that connection with the broader, boundless, soundless environment. And yes, frankly, you can get to the point where you can block out all input 
okay? And then you might go into a metaphysical thing where you're looking at archetypes and stuff like that that are brain generated. And then beyond that, you might experience something which is truly phenomenal. And this is an invitation. It's not a command. You have to live your life, and everybody is exactly where they're meant to be. Okay, so uh, if this is entertaining to you, or if this is, makes you curious, or there is a sense, um, as Eckhart used to say, of dis-ease in your life, and you're not sure what it's all about, it may be because the thing that brings you the happiness is what you're ignoring, and what you're trying to fix it with is stuff that's out here that appears to have substance outside of silence. So, I, I want to thank everyone for coming. If you have another question for Luke, you can ask him I'll here, hang out but we're <laughs> supposed to actually vacate by 10 o'clock, so we're a little over. So. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you.